Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there in podcast land. You are in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza, and I am really excited about speaking with our guest today. I'd like to look at this podcast as a water cooler chat, because we are actually going to talk about Netflix is dead to me, and why does that resonate with people today? It has been approved for a second season, so they're obviously doing something right. And for those that are unfamiliar with the show, it, it has a, a ton of plot twists. It has comedy and drama. It has Christina Applegate, for all those fans like me that used to watch Married with Children. She's done a lot since then, and she's in this. Uh, she's actually executive producer. But uh, her husband was in a hit-and-run death. And uh, there's another character dealing with multiple miscarriages, and so they're dealing with grief support. So we're going to talk about, you know, why are we frequently unwilling to talk about these important topics, and thus talking about them, do they really help? So I thought that we'd get an expert in here to talk about that. We have, we're going to get some answers from Reverend Megan Smith-Brooks. She's an ordained unity minister. She's a licensed spiritual educator and certified grief coach whose younger son was also murdered. She is the author of the new book, Unraveling Grief, A Mother's Spiritual Journey of Healing and Discovery. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Reverend Megan Smith-Brooks to the podcast. Welcome, Megan. Thank you. I'm delighted to be with you today. Yes. um, thanks Thanks for coming. And we're talking about grief, and in today's paper here in Atlanta, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, I guess it's only appropriate, since we're talking about grief, to have a brief moment of silence to the waistlines of Americans since the pandemic. Uh, In the article, (laughs) everyone has larger sizes in response to the increasing weight size for staying in the house. So there's so many ways that we're experiencing grief. (laughs) That is a side effect. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) So, yes, welcome to the podcast. Um, Yeah, you know what? I I do have to say, um, you know, we're going to go across your background and, and everything, of course. And with Dead to Me, I just wanted to ask you, because I don't know if you knew or not, but most men, I think I'm speaking for most men, it's going to be a generalization, we love it when women cry. We just absolutely love it. So we should watch every show, right? Like, of course, I'm being facetious. It's hard to watch women (laughs) crying in every episode talking about grief. Megan, please help us, help the guy (laughs) enjoy this show, because I think we're missing out. Well, you know, one of the important things about this show is it's one of the few things that actually brings grief out into the open, into the conversation. And I think that's the relevant point here. And um, men in our society have traditionally been taught that crying is a sign of weakness. And so you're supposed to suppress that. You're supposed to be the tough guy. You're supposed to, you know, be there, um, you know, to with a strong arm to hold the weaker woman and um, help her through this. And because of that, men are uncomfortable with tears, with showing emotion, with, you know, being open to what you're feeling in the moment. And that's one of my big points in dealing with grief is that if we suppress it, we are affecting our health and wholeness. So men, it's time to cry. (laughs) okay you know it's really funny because of the pandemic because of this right of course we're making light uh, lightheartedness of of what's really serious but i think when you said it's time to cry in the past let's say pre-pandemic you could hide somewhere or maybe drive away to another (laughs) cul-de-sac but since everyone's in the house you can't escape your wife your spouse (laughs) because they're going to catch you crying So what happens when that happens? Well, you know, one of the things that I observed from my own grief process, and you you mentioned my son was murdered. um, That was seven years ago. He was 29, an adult. And as you can imagine, um, the impact on anyone um, realizing that your child has been killed, but then to find out it was murdered, and then ultimately I found out it was an intentional act. And 
one of the things that I observed is people's awkwardness and uncomfortable. Um, it's like the elephant in the room when there's something that's painful and nobody knows what to say. Um, they're uncomfortable with my emotional pain and my grief. And as I watch this, I see it as a symptom of our society that um, we need to be bringing it out in the open and teaching people to be more comfortable with embracing the feelings that you're having, especially pain. And so if, if men are uncomfortable with that because women are more predisposed to just letting their emotions be um, you know, out in the open, it's symptomatic of how we have suppressed dealing with what's real, what's happening, because grief is a part of the human experience. You cannot escape it if you're breathing. So, um, you know, dead to me brings that out. It's like, how are we handling it? We can make some really bad decisions because we're not dealing with our grief. We're suppressing it. So unresolved grief is going to come out and blindside us. Mm-hmm. Crying is a way of processing your feelings. It's letting that emotion get out. It's a healthy outlet. Sure. And, and that I think that was really huge when you're talking about bad decisions for not dealing with grief. And I think you're going to help me out because I usually try to be really objective. And I've, and I've only seen the first two episodes of the first season. And I think I could have gone further but there was something that was stopping me and maybe I was triggered Uh, for the first episode. It seems like the lady's lying to me, right? You find out that she's, she actually broke up with her spouse and, Mm -hmm. you know, Christina Applegate is like, wow, you know, that's already a breach of trust and I just met you. And and then you see that she actually ran over her, her husband. So you're like, so I'm just kind of triggered with all these different emotions of I'm, I'm grieving because I lost my spouse. And this other person comes along whom I don't know, and and now I find out that she's been lying to me from the beginning. You know, right? You know, so how easily are we um, hurt by people not being open and authentic, and mm-hmm. um, and being real about their feelings and what's going on in their life? Because that other character was really hiding some other underlying um, pain. Didn't she have some miscarriages? So that's really what her grief was from. And then she's embarrassed and hurt because her, um, her boyfriend didn't leave, left her, didn't die. Um, Mm -hmm. So she didn't know how to talk about it. She didn't know how she was embarrassed. She doesn't know how to bring out her feelings. And, and so grief is underlying all of us in so many ways because we're afraid of being authentic to what's happening within us, of talking about the pain of life and feeling like we're going to be judged and somehow condemned or, or pointed out as, um, you know, unworthy or not good enough, whatever story we tell ourselves. Mm. So I think this is a yeah. great example of um, how we handle life because we aren't taught to have skills or practices or ways of dealing with the pain of life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was a really good point. When you're, when you're talking about the pain of life, it it do, it doesn't seem like there's a, a scale, if you will. But on some level, I think that's what they covered, where your grief isn't like mine because of what I've gone through versus what you've gone through. How do you mm-hmm. bridge that conversation to say that we're all on the same page and dealing with or there i believe there's five steps of grief so i guess you can go through that as well but how do you compare i mean you don't you're not supposed to compare but you can't take it all in by yourself either so how do you bridge that gap even though you may be experiencing grief differently from the next person well not all of us have the conscious awareness of um the pain that I'm experiencing versus the pain of someone else. And so we tend to go into the comparison. And if we're, we're playing the victim card of our, of our grief, which is very easy to do. And it, and it doesn't mean, um, you know, minimizing what somebody's experiencing, but you know, 
I could really call the, you know, the card. It's like, well, hey, wait, my son was murdered, so my grief has got to be more painful than yours. Mm -hmm. Pain is pain. It doesn't matter where it came from. So that's where I say bringing it out into the conversation and not necessarily get entrenched in the details or whose pain may be more painful than other because it depends on what our life experience has been. You know, what do we grow up? Um, how to process it, how to deal with it. Mostly in our culture, um, we are taught to minimize it. Um, so, you know, going back to, you know, men not being comfortable with um, sadness and tears, we are comfortable with talking about the pain of life. And I think that what's going on in the world right now is, is bringing out into the open our need to have conversations so that we don't get caught up in playing the victim card or the martyr game or um, acting badly because we never processed our unresolved grief that we carry around with us, no matter what it's from. Mm -hmm. There has to be a forum where we can say, feeling this pain is a healthy thing to do, but I need a way of how to process it so that I can thrive in life and that I don't take it out on others mm -hmm. so I think that you know that show is um, an example of just showing us how we we process life and we may not be doing it well because we don't know any better mm. well and that takes me to your your actual practice practice because you're an ordained Unity, uh, Unity Minister, you've practiced, as, you've had several ministries in, in Arizona, California, and Ohio, 25 years of experience, as, as a matter of fact, so in, in the spiritual education coaching. So what's the difference and how do you bridge the gap from a spiritual aspect versus, like you said, here in a generalized American culture, we're minimizing feeling overall, and in this instance, minimizing the pain. You know, I don't really know that there is a significant difference other than from a spiritual perspective. Um, what I have learned is that we build a foundation in life. Um, and when we're able to have some awareness of my thoughts, my words, my actions, and that everything is putting into motion an equal response vibrationally. I have control over what I want to put into motion in my life. And when it bounces back and it's not feeling good or, or something traumatic happens that is not in my control, I still have a choice of how to respond. And so from a spiritual place, what I've taught people is um, to embrace your pain, that we have to just sort of allow ourselves to go into it so that we can feel it as deeply as we possibly can, to go into that, I call it like, for me, it was like a tsunami of waves of unbearable pain, of trying to process what had happened in my life, what had happened to my son, the fact that I would never see him again or hear his voice or, or see what he might, the potential of his life and what the outcome might be. If we get consumed in that, we can, we can get lost and it will destroy us. One of the things that I, um, I wanted to share is to really understand what grief is and how it affects us. It's not just affecting us emotionally. That's the obvious thing. That, um, you know, a loss of someone, especially somebody that we love that has died, but it can be the loss of anything in our life. But we have this attachment to it, this bond, this affection that's been formed. But also, grief is an emotional response to, um, that has a physical, a cognitive, a behavioral, social, cultural, spiritual, and philosophical dimension to it. So it affects every part of who we are. And that's what, unless we've been taking time to understand it, process it, and maybe get some help, we don't realize how it's affecting our life and how it might be blindsiding us. So spiritual practice helps you have a foundation so that you're more um, able to process the unexpected life experiences. Mm. If we're just out there floundering on our own, 
then um, we're going to be more susceptible to being um, destroyed and unable to hmm. function. Now, when you mean destroy, do you mean, I, I know in certain cultures there is that uh, death, if you will, uh, scenario where you have to go through death to actually come through life, right? And so if, mm -hmm. if we can apply that to 2020, right, there's a lot of things that are going to go away. There's going to be a lot of grief related to the attachment of the way things were, but by going mm -hmm. through that death experience, you should be more so like, you know, the phoenix rising from the ashes. Absolutely. You know, I like Jap Joseph Campbell's work. Um, actually, my older son went through a, um, um, a ritual, what do you call it, a rite of passage when he was um, 13 that is symbolic of that idea that um, as we evolve, who we are and what we have and how we show up and what we do in our life um, may work for a while, but then something comes to an end because spiritually we are designed to, to evolve and to transform and that nothing stays the same forever. Otherwise, it eventually becomes stagnant and no longer serves us. So it's like um, the process of forgiveness um, it's been attributed, this has been attributed to a lot of people, but it, it actually goes back to, I believe, a Buddhist teaching that says forgiveness is, unforgiveness is like taking poison and expecting the other person to die. It's mm -hmm. the same thing with, with grief in that the toxicity is affecting us. So on a um, vibrational level, on a spiritual level, um, the destruction means is that I stop functioning in a healthy way. I might have an, uh, it might affect my health. I might start having physical symptoms. Um, it may be that I'm so overwhelmed, unable to make healthy decisions. And so my life starts to, uh, I'm not thriving anymore. It takes mm -hmm. on, there's people that get so stuck in their pain that they take on a victim consciousness and, um, and blame everything in the world um, for why nothing is good in their life. Mm -hmm. And when we get stuck in that, we're not going to be able to move forward. Um, so from a spiritual place, what I teach is everything is a choice. And some of the choices may not be choices that we um, really like. And yet, walking through the fire, allowing the death to happen so that I can be reborn and transformed and come out in a better place is the gift that's being offered in any situation, like grief. I believe that grief is a deep transformational process that if we're willing to embrace it, we will discover a gift that enhances who we are and we come out on the other side a much more empowered version of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it, this is a, probably a third party question because I don't think a, a third party could really know what an individual is going through it, from the aspect of the TV show Dead to Me. She had five miscarriages, right? And so a third party person would say, well, why, did, why didn't she stop after the first one, you know, second one, third one, four, and a fill in the blank. But it was ultimately her choice to go through the five and then ultimately, you know, this isn't going to happen to me. Um, it, on one level, it seems like some of these, uh, like you're saying, these transformations are personal, but they're a collective mm -hmm. too. Like, how do you make that distinction? Well, you know, it just goes to show how easily it is for us to judge others. You know, who are we to say we haven't been living inside of them and to know what's important or, or why choices were made or what happened in their life. And so as a minister, I, I have um, do my best to just be open to a person and, and what's real for them. You know, those five babies that she lost, that's a real pain. And it, obviously she didn't process that grief. And so it affected her on so many different levels and how she was living her life. But who is somebody else to suggest that she doesn't deserve to have a child and to work through that in her own way. Mm -hmm. So 
I think that, you know, when we look at what's happening in the world right now, the world as it was is never going to be the same again. And, and there's a lot of people that are in total denial of that. It also, I think it, it, what we're seeing is a reflection of those that have established a foundation of how to deal with change, and especially um, a traumatic change or change that can affect you on, on every aspect of your life, and those that have never dealt with how to deal with change that don't have the foundation of how to embrace it and if we can't come to accepting that something is going to be different, then we're going to be constantly trying to fight to get back to where we were, and that's never going to come back together in the same way. So if we can be open to, um, you know, grief is, the, is a teacher. Grief allows us to understand that pain is just as important as joy, and it's the same intensity on a, on a, on a feeling level but it's just one side of the spectrum to the other. Mm-hmm. And our, as a human being, our job is to be comfortable with all the, the spectrum of emotions and feelings. And to step back and reflect and go, okay, this is happening. Did I choose it? Maybe not. Am I comfortable with it? Perhaps not. Am I happy about it? No. What are my options then? How, what mm-hmm. can I do? to take care of myself, to um, learn to adapt. So that's, that's how I handle it. That's what I've learned about this is that, you know, right now I'm waiting to um, release my book. And um, my practice has been to learn patience because I don't have control over the publishing process. And I, if it was my choice, it would have already been released. But there's elements that I don't have control over so I have to just take a deep breath and go okay it's going to come about in its own time what we're seeing in the world is all of all of that we haven't been willing to deal with which is what unresolved grief is is coming out into the open so that we can look at it and see it for what it is and realize what's important and are we going to embrace doing something different that serves the whole better? It doesn't mean that you, you dismantle everything, but you bring with you only the things that continue to serve us to thrive and then add on to it the new things that will enhance it. And I think grief teaches us that. I want to ask you a global question and a, a global time question, if you will. So from a mm-hmm. timing aspect, the United States is a relatively young country, okay, and from the world stage. And Mm -hmm. as as you're talking, you're talking about American culture minimizing pain and such, it made me think of one of my, uh, one of my sisters had moved to Germany in early 2000. And so when 9-11 happened here, of course, it was, it was major here in the States, but overseas, they were like, now you understand what we go through. And when we're, you're talking about embrace pain, for the most part, collectively, at least here, we're not used to, you know, collectively, collectively again, we're not used mm-hmm. to pain or elongated pain, right? So mm-hmm. we're used to getting over, just get over it, uh, even in Dead to Me, the, in that first episode, there's a, a, a scene with, Christina Applegate and her son, and she's like, it's time for you to go back, you know, society says it's time for you to go back to school, and the kid's like, I don't want, I'm not ready to go back to school, and the mom wasn't, she had been months since she had gone into the the uh, the playroom, if you will, of her husband in, in, the, in the separate mm-hmm. carriage house. So, you know, how, how and, and, and the second part is the response even here in the States to the pandemic versus the rest of the world where everyone's kind of pointing the finger at us of how we're responding. Uh, do you think mm-hmm. it's all related just to, you know, our, I don't want to say inability to deal with it. It's just that it's not, it's so new to us. It's a new feeling. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and that's like what I said. It's like there are those that um, have done the foundational work that have the ability to cope with change and embrace it in healthy ways, and there are clearly many that do not. And so what we're seeing is 
when we are immature spiritually, I'll just put it that way, it means we have not really evolved to where we're um, practicing, um, for instance, deep breathing. You know, we're allowing all the oxygen to come in and, and to um, get into every cell so that it's reaching every place within our body so that we can thrive. If we're shallow breathing, uh, we're going to hyperventilate, we're going to overreact, we're going to um, act out. Um, if we're a five-year-old, we're going to handle things different than if we're um, a 25-year-old. So the five-year-olds are out there going, you can't make me do this. I'd, it's against my rights. I, you know, it's, it's, you know, and it's, but yet you can't make somebody grow up faster than they already are. Mm -hmm. It's all about consciousness from a spiritual place. So we have to evolve. I think that we, um, as a country and as a human race, are evolving. And those that are, let me put this in a perspective of, it's what's the most important thing? Is it about how much money I can make? Or is it about um, caring for myself and my family and my community and the people around me? We are all being called to make a choice and to recognize what's relevant. And whether we're going to be a part of, a, of creating a system that supports the thriving of all, or am I just going to be self-centered and it's all about me? One of the things I noticed when I was um, moving through my grief experience is mm -hmm. the tendency for people to want you to get over it already. You know, haven't you grieved long enough? Isn't it time for you just to get back to life like it never happened? And for those of us that have experienced grief, and I'm pretty sure most people have on some level, but from a really intense place, it's, you don't get over it. You learn to live with it. And so that's the process of grief and the healing process is how do I live with something that part of me is trying to reject? that I don't want to have to live with. And yet, there's a place you come to acceptance. I can't get back what I, what I want, what I had. And so we're seeing all this acting out in our country and in the world of those that are, that are trying to force it to be back the way it was or what allows them to not have to feel discomfort. Mm. And until they can come to acceptance, until we come as a whole to accept that the world is changing, our country is changing, our societies are changing, as we evolve with new information and new technology, we need to be open to um, continually release what no longer serves us, embrace the new things, and find a way to integrate it. And the strong leaders are the ones that are able to guide their people through that. We're struggling with it here in the United States right now. Right. And, and it's interesting, and I have to put this time stamp, so it's July 26, 2020. The reason why I did the time stamp is, you know, there's still a projection of a, a second wave in the fall. And everyone experiences, like you're saying, build the foundation and we can't Monday morning quarterback, but there could have been an opportunity, you know, it's been four months plus where if you're in the house, this could have been a time of, of understanding, breathing and, and silence, right? But for the most part, at least here in the States, you had more of a binging of television and, and the distractions, like you said, with technology. Do you think that lessons learned is if we do have a second wave that is what we, we we weren't expecting in the first wave but if it's something beyond our comprehension is this a, a do-over as to a white a right way to build a foundation on life and and make some transformations well of course you know and i i see every day as that i also see that um something that's not being talked a lot about is okay how do we support people that all of a sudden are finding um, their life as they know it no longer exists. They are struggling because they don't know how to cope. Um, 
I was already living my life, mostly working from home. I've been writing, I've been developing programs and, um, and seeing that working with people um, was going to be a virtual experience um, that I don't have to be face to face. So I was already thinking of that along those lines, but not everybody has been. So it's about, I think we need to be talking about how do we help people with self-care? How do we help people um, look at things in a new way and to see this time as a gift to really get to know myself, to make the changes that I knew I needed to make anyway Mm -hmm. Um, so that I can be a healthier version of myself, you do not have to be gaining weight just because all of a sudden you're spending more time at home. You can still choose to uh, make healthy choices. I have lost weight, but I was doing that before because I was making some healthy changes in my life because I put it as a priority. You have more time to exercise, so there's no excuse to be sitting around and doing nothing. There's things you can do in your house. You can still go for walks. You can, our, our DNA as both spiritual and human beings, as divine and human, is to express ourselves creatively. And when we suppress that, and I think unresolved grief does that, then we feel stagnant. So this is a, a beautiful time for us to find a new way to express ourselves. What is it that's been wanting, to, that's alive in you that's been wanting to be expressed and you didn't have the time to do it? Mm. I got my book done. <laughs> I've been, you know, spending, you know, time painting. I've actually written a children's version of my book. Um, it's really more of a story. It's to help children deal with sadness. And I'm playing around with creating the illustrations for it. I am using my time um, productively um, by exploring new things. So why aren't we talking to people about that? Instead of what's been taken from you, what can you add to your life because of this gift of time you've been given? Mm -hmm. Um, and going back to Dead to Me, the, the very first scene, I think they made a, 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 a slight nod to this. And it was an Asian woman that had brought, you know, she had brought like a Mexican uh, crafts roll or whatever. But she was coming to her like, hey, we, you know, we know you're going through grief if you have anyone to speak with. And then Christina pretty much slammed the door in her face. On what level should we, because we're in a lot of neighborhoods around the country where there are multiple cultures in the, in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So how do we embrace other cultures that may be doing something that we're not, that we can learn from or we can learn from each other? Well, you know, that's a really good point, and that's some of the things that we are also seeing is that, you know, even in our country, there's a lot of cultural differences in the different parts of our country. I grew up in the Northwest. Um, I now am living in, well, Cincinnati, they call it the Midwest. That doesn't seem right to me. It's closer to the East Coast. But anyway, um, I'm seeing that life is different. Um, we have, um, our country has been founded on immigration. So of course we have people from different countries and different belief systems and different spiritual practices that that manage and handle things differently. So instead of feeling fearful or avoiding or suspicious of people that are different than us, why are we not embracing that? And, you know, for me, one of the gifts in, in, in grief is, is realizing gratitude, the gratitude for the little things that show up in our life. And so if somebody comes to my door offering me something, and it might seem weird to me or I'm feeling uncomfortable or I don't know them. Would it not be better to just say thank you and maybe just let them know I'm not really open to company right now, but I really appreciate your thoughtfulness. Mm -hmm. Again, we don't talk about those things. We don't teach those things about honoring our differences and um, instead of, assuming one thing maybe it's asking questions to understand you know i'm sorry that seemed a little weird why are you doing that <laughs> instead of <laughs> slamming the door in their face um i just you know i just think there's a lot of things we could do better 
I, I had an experience with um, my administrative assistant. I was serving a ministry in California when my son was murdered. And it really took me back because I thought, well, especially somebody that was, you know, working with me and had an understanding of our belief systems and our spiritual practices would certainly have compassion understanding with what I was feeling. Mm-hmm. And after about three months, she told me, um, shouldn't I be over it already? You know, it's mm. like I, I bring it, I talk about it too often. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but it's still very real for me. I tried to be aware of, you know, how I brought it up and how I talked about it and things, but it was on my mind 24-7. And mm. I realized that not everybody understands um the process of emotion or what somebody might be going through or because they're uncomfortable with somebody else's pain because they haven't managed their own, they would like that other person to just not bring it out so that they don't have to see it or be aware of it anymore. Mm -hmm. So shows like um, Dead to Me, I think, help people, hopefully they're having some conversations about um, how those characters are managing life and pain and grief and how um, everybody does it a little differently. Um, there is no perfect way. There is no right way. It is what works for me. Mm-hmm. And can um, I, as long as somebody's not hurting me or breaking a law, can I just accept how they handle it? Right. Uh, One thing that I was thinking about, Megan, was a uh, conversation I had some time ago with a disaster consultant. And this consultant had been to Chernobyl. They'd gone to, you know, 9-11 physically, you know, and helped in the the, um, reconstruction and such. Uh, He did the Katrina, you know, all these places. And one, one particular example I'd like to share was there were, there was a fire in upstate New York, and it was, let's say, apples to apples. So there were two diff- two separate fires on two separate occasions, and the fire were, they both happened in apartment complexes. And in and, and the fire for apartment A, they had um, one death and minimal damage. And then in apartment B, you know, across town somewhere or across the state, there was multiple deaths and multiple millions of dollars of damage. And he said the lessons learned from observing those two circumstances was in apartment A, or example A, everyone knew each other. So they kind of looked out for each other, like they knew, you know, Mm -hmm. the lady down on level one with the cat or she hasn't been out feeding the birds today. So when the fire happened, people knocked on each other's doors and they had minimal damage. And the, mm-hmm. the second example, no one, everyone, everyone kind of kept to themselves. You know, they were like, you know, that's your deal. My, you know, I'm looking out for number one. And that's where they had multiple damage. So do you think this, like you said, for a transformation that's happening or ultimately can happen, do you think that yet this is like a great opportunity to actually know your neighbors and if it is, you know, how do you go, I mean, we're not even talking different cultures now where they're like, get away from me because you're not socially distancing. How do you, how do you bridge mm-hmm. that gap? Well, you know, again, it's like everybody's come from a different um, education, geographical influence of their, their society, their cultural um, practices and whether they're an introvert or an extrovert and and how they communicate or interact. And we're seeing that like on the news and in the media and the differences of how people handle things. But I think that's a really important uh, demonstration of when we take time to get to know the people that are around us and we, instead of get so caught up in our own selves, we embrace the humanity of, of everyone around us and um, and being more caring and considerate. You know, even if I didn't know my neighbor but and knowing that there's a threat to go and knock on the door and make sure that they, they weren't home and that they were, you know, they would get out or if they know they had an animal, those kind of things, 
it's a difference in awareness and how do I embrace um, humanity um, versus am I um, reacting from a more fearful place of um, seeing everyone around me as a threat instead of as a potential um, um, enhancement of my life. Mm-hmm. And I don't, you know, I think some of that is, is taught and some of that is um, innately understood, but um, what I'm seeing happening in the world and especially um, breaking out in our country is there is so much fear that people have lost the ability to trust um, others. And when we're acting from a place of fear, we, re- we, we react to life instead of respond. Um, we, we try to, you know, we're trying to preserve ourselves and we're pushing everybody away. And that's never going to be a formula for um, success or um, a positive outcome. Mm-hmm. When you said react to life, that, that made me think of, you know, the past four months and you were talking about uh, spiritually immature or immature spiritually here in, as a generalization across the country. And and I'm playing devil, devil's advocate here because I am a sports fan. Uh, I love sports, what have you. And since we yeah. didn't take the time to be quiet and, and learn breathing and, and getting close to our maker, uh, there's been a lot of upheaval, to put it nicely. And do you think mm-hmm. since it is a, we are immature spiritually, that's why there's a push to, to bring back major sports because it was a good deterrent or distraction of what we're dealing with regularly if we can just focus on something else and not have to deal with it. Well, yeah, I mean, it's something about being able to check out from my life um, that's why I like, you know, to read a, a really good fiction book. <laughs> I can sort of, you know, and get engaged with somebody else's experience. And, you know, in a, in a real world, there's a balance in all things. And, and that doesn't mean that, you know, watching sports is, is not a good thing. But we can lose ourselves in, um, you know, if, if we say, for instance, how will I survive if I don't have my sports on TV again? Um, so it's a reality check for all of us. Um, and we're seeing that things are coming back differently. And so it's like, check in with yourself. How are you feeling about this isn't comfortable because it's not the way I was used to it? Hmm. So is there a part of me that's trying to reject that? Or is there a part of me that's curious and, and maybe open to like, well, let's just see how it feels then. Because eventually I might get more comfortable with this new form of the way things are. Mm. So, you know, you don't want to just toss out everything and um, say it has to be one way. How do we find a balance so that there's a way to support everyone? There may be a little bit that we're, you know, we don't have the way we want it, but that's the evolution of life. Um, Mm. Those are the ones that, that thrive are the ones that are able to adapt to the change and be more curious than fearful. Okay. Well, I, I have a multiple world question for you. And <laughs> from a multiple world question, it'll be a softball, don't worry. So in, in, this, multiple, in this multiple world, uh, in my old life, I, I'm like you I'm, today. My current life is, is indoors. I do a lot of uh, inbound marketing, what have you, so for years. So it was kind of easier to, it wasn't that big of a transition going on what's happening now. But in a previous life, I was, I had to travel around the country and I was working with an architecture firm and we had to, we designed research labs. So we would go in this instance, we would go to, uh, depending on where you are, whoever you're listening, whoever's listening, Louisville, 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 right? There's three ways to say it. Uh And yeah. so we're there and, you know, we're at a bar or whatever, and a fight breaks out because, you know, somebody says Kentucky's better than Louisville or whatever, right? And you're like, wow, okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> and so you're like, oh, w- w- what year did you graduate from Lu- Louisville, 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 right? What year did you mm-hmm. graduate? You're like, I-, I didn't go, right? So you're like, you put all this stock into an entity that <laughs> you don't ha- – I mean, it doesn't even reflect you. You're not even getting a paycheck 
from them, right? But you put all of your energy right. into this entity. So today, you're seeing, I'm seeing multiple worlds, and that's why I want to get your opinion, because there, mm-hmm. there is that um, reluctance to go back to work. But if we look at the celebrities or the athletes, right, some of them are like, <laughs> I feel sick today. I'm not going to go in for work. They get paid millions mm-hmm. of dollars. And they're the ones right. that are getting tested more frequently than the other half. So it's a long question about the have and have nots. Uh, what's your mm-hmm. take on that where it seems like a, there is a, different, a definite chasm and it seems like a caste system is forming in this country? Yeah, that's, um, I think that's a bit scary. Um, I believe that what we're seeing is, is the lack of, of balance and um, that what we have, I think that there's been this um, this push for the corporate America and that that's sort of the model of success and um, that we somehow have forgotten that not everybody can accomplish the same level of goals. It doesn't mean that they're less than or incapable, but they didn't have the opportunities for whatever reason to um, elevate themselves. I believe that we should all have the opportunity to thrive, to survive, to have the basic elements of um, of a breathing space. You know, to have a, a home and food and safety, and that those focuses need to be brought back into as the decisions are made from a leadership level. Um, I, um, the call for change is huge and we're seeing the extremes and I, I believe that people have the right to demonstrate their opinions, to protest things that we have that in, but it's gotten, it's lost its way, you know, by destroying things, by, um, fighting others, it doesn't serve a purpose and it doesn't have a positive outcome. But clearly the imbalance in our country and our culture is clear. But from a spiritual place, the only way that things can be transformed to make it um, at a better place of thriving for all is to bring it all out into the open. There's been too much that's been hidden in the darkness that Mm -hmm. um, has, and, and everything that's happening right now is bringing it all into the light. There's nothing that can hide. And so the, the ugliness of what we have created is very visible. And mm-hmm. not everybody is, is willing to accept it. Um, mm-hmm. And I, like many, are like, I don't know the answers, but, but if we move forward with a positive intention, I believe that we can reconstruct and come back into a place where um, we can find a way to, to have the balance to support all people. We've lost our way. We've lost the compassion for humanity, I believe. And there are many now that are stepping up and vocalizing um, that. Marianne Williamson, um, actually, she's writing the foreword to my book. That's one of the pieces we're waiting to put into place here. I deeply respect her and her her willingness to um, challenge um, what's happening and to not just be complacent and go with the norm and and to be, you know, that reflection of uh, what needs to be looked at um, and and have the courage to be the voice that isn't welcomed by everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, we I think need that. Um, it, it's interesting when, when, you, when you said that because, you know, so, uh, one could argue, oh, well, it's, tw- <clears throat> excuse me, it's 2020, and what she stands for, it's not great for the the whole United States, right? And you're like, like it's mm-hmm. it's a new concept, but you know, if we scratch a little bit and get some dirt under our nails, we know that this type of uh, mindset has been happening since the 1920s. And scratch a little more, you know, the 1850s. There's always been that element that she espouses. And it seems from a from a general acceptance of that, uh, it, it's still a, a huge reluctance because it, it's not the it's not the mainstream. Absolutely, and and what we're starting to realize is that is the mainstream what we should be adhering to anymore? 
because mm-hmm. even the mainstream needs to transform. Even the mainstream needs to be willing to um, release what no longer serves the whole, what's no longer working, and embrace new concepts and ideas so that we can integrate them into what we're becoming. We should always be open into becoming something new and fresh and more empowering, and um, it's, it's a consciousness expanding process. But we can't comprehend the possibility if we haven't been doing our own work to be willing to um, be courageous enough to look at the deep parts of ourselves that are wounded, um, that um, have withdrawn because of pain and, and, and we don't know how to cope, that um, are fearful, that have felt neglected or condemned or abused, to bring all of that out to be healed and transformed. We need to be teaching people how to do that so that instead of trying to judge those that are different or, th- or somebody that speaks something that I'm unfamiliar with or is uh, frightening to me, doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. But I might be open en- enough to consider the possibility of it before I make a decision. Marianne Williamson is challenging us to do that. Absolutely. And, and before we started recording, I had mentioned uh, the spiritual community here in Atlanta, and uh, the sister that I talked about earlier, she had committed suicide. And in the spiritual oh. community, you know, there's a, a grief community. And, and one of the ladies, uh, she had spirit. She's part of, like, this big grief council, if you will, or uh, foundation. And, and this happened in the 70s that she was, like, a pillar of the community, right? The, the general, I mean, if I could separate the two, even though they should be together, the spiritual community, mm-hmm. spiritual community and the mainstream community. And the reason why I bring mm-hmm. up the 70s is because she's this pillar and then her son committed suicide. And so mm-hmm. she was, you know, sharing with us how, you know, the feelings that she felt of if I'm the pillar, this should never happen to me. Like, how are people going to look at me because it happened to me, mm-hmm. how should I respond? And so with you and your background, I, I just wanted you if, you, if you don't mind, sharing mm-hmm. your process of forgiveness for uh, what happened with your son seven years ago. Well, forgiveness is a huge spiritual practice and tool for um, healing and transforming our lives. And, you know, I have dealt with people that have dealt with, that have had that, uh, you know, death by suicide by a family member and how it can destroy them. And I think back in the 70s, it was more of a stigma, you know, like you caused that to happen or um, the effect on the family when somebody chooses to take their life is tremendous. I had a, a friend that committed suicide and one of the things that um, a mutual minister helped me understand was, you know, one, it's like you can't put yourself in somebody else's life and understand what they're dealing with and what they're coping with and what they feel they can cope with or not. And that that particular person felt like she just wasn't, she was only living halfway in this world that she wasn't, she didn't belong here anymore. So I came to accept that was her choice. It's not mine to decide for her what she should or shouldn't have done. So forgiveness, like I said before, um, it's a practice that we do for ourselves. It's not about letting the other person off the hook. It doesn't mean that um, that whatever somebody does, um, they're not um, to be held accountable, that there aren't consequences to their, their actions. And so for me, I learned a lot more than I ever wanted to know about the judicial system walking through this process. Um, it took 18 months before the detectives um, um, found the two men that were primarily responsible for my son's murder and arrested them, went through another two years of the legal process of delays and whatever, and eventually they, um, they bargained for a, um, what do you call it? They just spaced out. <clears throat> um, it didn't go to trial, so they ex- accepted a um, plea bargain 
and um, one of them was in exchange for information because there were other people involved. It's still an open case for that part of it. But what I had to realize is that as a spiritual teacher, if I was going to teach the value of forgiveness as a practice for living, I had to practice it myself, and this was a huge test and how I would do that. So it's about separating yourself and the impact of actions that others have made on you and, um, and not focusing my energy against them because they did this horrible thing. But to release myself from the bondage of that energy that will just be dragging me for the rest of my life if I live in with anger and, you know, vengeance and um, feeling victimized because somebody did something to me or affected my life, that I could forgive them. And, and ultimately, I went to a parole hearing for one of the defendants the one that um, did not actually pull the trigger. My son was shot three times. And part of the process was um, that I could write a statement that I read um, to him in the parole hearing. Um, This was in the state of Missouri, and the process, um, they were very compassionate in how they handle it. The defendant is at the um, prison in a room, And so he's on a a big TV screen, so he wasn't in the same room that I was in. And I was in the room with the parole board. Um, When I read the letter, he he could hear me, but he couldn't see me. So um, it was less intimidating that way. But I actually wrote in my letter that um, my spiritual practice is, um, is forgiveness. And so I forgive him for his actions because... I believe that a spiritually immature person would choose to take another's life because they don't understand the value of life. Mm. And that um, it isn't for me to condemn him or hold that against him and that whatever he did, he did in the moment from his lack of spiritual maturity and that he's in prison now because of the consequence of his action, and that's where he deserved to be. Mm-hmm. But that I released him energetically from my focus because self-care and um, releasing me from that toxic energy that unforgiveness is was a gift I give myself. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I do hold my intention for this young man, because he was only 19 when he was arrested, and um, he had the lesser of the sentence of 14 years because he gave some information that could be helpful. But um, my intention for him is that he uses the resources of the prison system to educate himself, to heal himself, to transform himself, and to come out into society as a better human being. Um, that he can use this opportunity to grow. Mm-hmm. And then, and for me, that then, um, he gives himself the potential of a better life that my son didn't have. And that's almost like um, making my son matter somehow, if that mm-hmm. makes any sense at all. It makes a ton of sense. <clears throat> uh, to bring more, thank you for sharing that. Um, and just to bring some more levity to it, 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 it's the example of Christina Applegate, right? Like she's not allowing mm-hmm. the process to happen. I know, and mind you, I've only seen two episodes, so I'm glad that I actually had the conversation with you because I was actually stopping. But, you know, in, in the two episodes, she's doing the quote-unquote detective work and going by and checking out cars and stuff and, and not following the process. So uh, you you've been – Definitely instrumental. Uh, I mean, you dropped a lot of nuggets today. The two big takeaways that I have is the uh, process of forgiveness and then also uh, the patience and understanding that that battle between free will and God's will. And it sounds like we may have just scratched the surface, and you do have Mm -hmm. the forward coming from Marianne Williamson for your new upcoming book, Unraveling Grief, A Mother's Spiritual Journey of Healing and Discovery, how could people find out when the book's coming out? What's your website if they have additional information for, that they want to get from you? Um, my website is, I have an alternative ministry. It's Unity Awakening Ways. So the website is 
www.unityawakeningwaysoneword.org. And um, if you would like to be on the pre-sale list to get informed when the book is available, you can email unravelinggrief at gmail.com, and I will get you on that list. It will be uploaded onto Amazon and Ingram, and I also have just recorded an audio version, so that should be ready about the same time. I'm hoping um, in about another month um, that will be available on Audible. So um, those are the key things. I I do do grief healing retreats. I have a wonderful retreat partner who is a certified um, sound healer, a singer-songwriter, and we we use her vibrational work and integrate my grief coaching and guided meditation and do healing retreats. We have a virtual one coming up on August 22nd. Um, That's a Saturday. It'll be noon to 3.30 Eastern time. And all the retreat information is on the website. Um, I'm doing a live one at Unity Village in, in next March. So um, that would be a way to keep informed with um, the different activities and programs and events that I have. And I, I just, you know, for me, bringing grief out of the conversation in the world and helping people understand how important it is to embrace it in your life so that you can transform it and not let that painful energy hold you back. We all deserve to have a magnificent life. And you know, trauma, grief, pain, loss, all those things are going to happen. We can't avoid them. So we have to find a way to manage it and live with it. It's, it's not something that just goes away, no matter what other people hope. Um, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about it and, and to bring it out into the open, and there is lots more to say about it. Yes, and I am so happy that you have it coming out on Audible because I am a huge fan of, <laughs> of audio books. So I know some people turn their noses, but I get a lot of work done during the day while I listen to these great books, and I'm sure I'll add yours to the list. So with that, you. you have been in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. Megan, come back anytime. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. I'd love to have more chats with you. Thank you. Are we done?